of our series on proposed changes uh, for health reform, uh, specifically looking maybe at the AHCA that came out of the House a few weeks ago um, and the revisions or changes that the Senate is working on currently. Um, this week, we are going to talk specifically about essential essential health benefits coverage and why that is essential um, for all people, a guarantee for all people, but specifically for our vulnerable populations and people who experience or are at risk for homelessness. My name is Noelle Porter and I'm a policy analyst for the National Alliance to End Homelessness and together with the National Center, uh, excuse me, the National Council, Healthcare for the Homeless Council and the Community for Supportive Housing, Corporation for Supportive Housing, we are um, presenting this series to you about the importance of um, fighting for uh, certain benefits and certain um, essential sort of coverage for people who experience homelessness. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, essential health benefits went into effect in 2014 as a provision of the ACA, or Obamacare, as it's frequently called. Um, this provision requires that all plans, um, including individual and small group market plans, but also very specific to our population, Medicaid, um, cover a minimum set of benefits. Um, in developing the essential health benefits, the uh, administration commissioned the Institute of Medicine to d establish independent criteria for how these included benefits would be determined. Um, and they, they wanted to cover sort of a, a certain scope uh, with these benefits. So one, they must be affordable for consumers, for employers, and for taxpayers. Um, Two, they must maximize the number of people with insurance coverage, and we saw huge increases in the rate um, and number of people who gained coverage under the ACA's implementation. Three, these essential health benefits must protect the most vulnerable people um, by addressing the particular needs of those patients and populations. So um, in determining how many essential health benefits they, there would be, they wanted to make sure that the common needs of people who are vulnerable um, would be addressed. Then they wanted to encourage better care practices by promoting the right care to the right patient in the right setting at the right time. Um, and make sure that this improved the care that physicians and clinicians provided. We wanted to advance the stewardship of resources, uh, and this is by focusing on high value services and reducing the use of low value services. So value is defined as the outcome, the health outcome as relative to the cost. Uh, we also wanted to address the medical concerns of greatest importance to enrollees in EHB-related plans as identified through a public deliberative process. So uh, they opened up this discussion to the greater public and asked people to say what it is that concerned them, what it is that they wanted their health coverage to provide for them. Um, and then pr protect against the greatest financial risks due to catastrophic events or illnesses. So we know that uh, one catastrophic event, one major life change, one major illness can be a key contributor to experiencing homelessness for some individuals or families. And the um, the establishment of essential health benefits was, was in essence to prevent um, those kind of cataclysmic results. So there are 10 essential health benefits as defined by the IOM in 2014 and implemented into the Obamacare um, coverage. Um, and also just as a note, you should understand that um, within this provision, there's also uh, a lot of detail about how to review these EHBs, how to review any new additional EHBs. So certainly these things could be flexible. Um, upon review. But those 10 essential health benefits listed here include ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance use disorder services, including behavioral health treatment, prescription drugs, rehabilitative and habilitative services and devices, laboratory services, preventive and wellness services, and chronic disease, and pediatric services, including oral and vision care. Um, so I think it's important as we enter this climate where we are talking about um, 
reform to our healthcare system to understand what the arguments are on both sides. Um, in every one of the, the different sessions that we're providing um, in these 30 minutes on webinars, I think it's always important to argue who, to understand who's arguing for what on each side. So you'll hear many people say that um, essential health benefits ensure that every plan that anyone receives has a minimum standard for coverage. That just means that we are kind of setting a floor for what healthcare can should be, um, and we won't allow anyone to provide something that is less than essential um, in covering our populations. The cons and what's being argued on the Republican side as they propose reform are that it does increase the cost of coverage for all beneficiaries. So we sort of have to, um, there's a neutral cost uh, rising because these benefits have to be written into every plan and that makes the, the plans a little bit more expensive. Um, and then the other that you'll hear a lot about these days is that each of these benefits isn't relevant to all individuals. So the easiest example is why do I have to pay for maternity benefits if I'm not a woman or if I'm not a woman of, of age to, um, to have a baby? Um, another might be why do I need to pay for substance abuse coverage if I don't abuse substances? Um, and, and that's very common. I included a posting that many of you may have seen um, that's gone viral, um, and I won't read it to you, but it's sort of the argument that a lot of the things that taxpayers pay into are for the common benefit, the common good. Um, and then we need to understand that distributing that um, that payment structure helps us to have an improved society overall. And I think that we would say that that's very true of um, establishing essential health benefits across the, um, the spectrum of healthcare as well. So what's important to understand is that if EHBs are repealed or pulled out of um, any healthcare reform package, we could return to a pre-ACA benefits package status, um, and many experts actually argue that it could be worse than it had been previously. So in 2011, just to give you a snapshot, 62% of people had insurance plans that didn't cover maternity care. Um, and within that stat, I would urge you to remember that up to 50% of pregnancies in the United States are covered by Medicaid. So we have to really understand that delivery and birth in this country is being paid for by well-subsidized or fully subsidized plans that are being held right now to this standard. 34% um, of insurance plans across the country didn't cover substance abuse treatment. And within that, we also probably need to understand that a lot of them might have a provision to cover substance use treatment, but it might not be sufficient in our understanding of what it means to cover substance use treatment. 18% of plans in the U.S. Uh, at, before 2011 didn't cover any type of maternal health care. Um, and 9% of these plans didn't cover prescription drugs, which we know is something that really drives up the cost of healthcare prescription access. So the effect of an EHB would repeal would include um, people with pre-existing conditions not having the coverage that they need. Protections for this population in some ways might exist on paper, but insurers would stop covering specific services as a way to discourage enrollment by complex, costly enrollees. So simply that means that they might say, yes, your pre-existing condition will be covered, but it's going to cost this much more. So essentially pricing people out of the market. Or your pre-existing condition will be covered, but these specific treatments within it might not be addressed. Um, and so you can get the lowest common denominator of treatment, but it might not be effective for you, et cetera. Um, women would essentially be charged more than men for insurance if maternity coverage was needed. So. We'd have increased out-of-pocket costs for women. We would have increased coverage costs for women. And this can be true of other different populations as these EHB, um, the specifics of each of them may apply. Um, and then the burden for even insured people um, could really be more expensive um, with unaffordable medical bills, um, even if they have coverage, because previously covered benefits will uh, definitely cost more. Um, there are a lot of estimates out there about how prices will rise and premiums will rise with uh, the 
American Health Care Act that's come out of the House. Um, and, and so we're not looking at less expensive care if we repeal these things. Um, and insurers also, with this repeal, could effectively cap the amount that they'll pay for high cost or long term health needs, meaning that after a certain, um, a certain benefit threshold, they won't provide any more coverage and people will be paying all out of pocket after that. Specifically, the effect on vulnerable populations means that there would be a lack of preventative medical care. Um, so we saw that preventative care is an essential health benefit as defined in 2014. Um, this can lead to mental health crisis, unnecessary emergency department visits. Um, we can think of examples such as untreated asthma or untreated um, diabetes that lead to increased emergency usage or can lead to uh, worsening conditions of the, the disease or subsequent conditions after that. Um, and so preventative medical care, while it can be initially costly, saves a lot of money in the long term for our healthcare systems and for individuals. Um, the lack of substance abuse coverage, right now Medicaid covers the opioid crisis across the country more than any other provider or payer. Um, this lack of substance abuse coverage leads to increased instability, increased vulnerability. Untreated mental illness or substance use disorders um, can lead to instability, risk of homelessness, or homelessness. As we know, untreated physical illness or the ballooning cost to treat physical illness can as well. Um, and then a rise in medical bankruptcy due to increased out-of-pocket costs. Um, so we could see resultant um, episodic homelessness from financial crisis across the country, as well as from those um, preventative crises, crises or lack of substance abuse or mental health treatment. Um, so under the, the different components of the AHCA or the House's repeal and replace bill, um, the MacArthur Amendment specifically was the proposed change that, that could repeal essential health benefits. Um, and what it did, instead of just getting rid of them, was allow states to waive the federal EHBs and define their own. So they might define three, they might define two, they might simply repeal all ten of the essential benefits. We know that things like um, substance use treatment and uh, maternal care or um, or prenatal care are some of the most quickly or uh, um, frequently invoked of these benefits, and so those certainly would be on the table in each of these states. Um, a majority of the employer plans impose lifetime limits prior to the ACA, and more than one-sixth lacked limits on out-of-pocket spending. So the ACA's ban on annual and lifetime limits can only apply with respect to care that is considered essential health benefits. So if these benefits are repealed or in these states, we, we would now no longer have a ban on or a limit on lifetime spending. We would no longer have a maximum on out-of-pocket cost, and so we would see ballooning costs there. Similarly, the ACA currently only requires that plans cap enrollees annual out-of-pocket spending on care that's considered essential health benefits. So the definition of, as the definition of this essential health benefits narrows, the scope of these requirements then narrows as well. So if nothing was considered an essential health benefit, then these requirements would be completely meaningless. This could also undermine the Affordable Care Act ban um, on lifetime limits and um, for employer coverage. And that's really important to understand because I think people think, well, I'm covered by my employer, so I'm safe from some of these changes. And the AHCA, as proposed, currently allows caps or allows these caps to be redefined in employer benefits as well. So sicker individuals might not be driven from the insurance market altogether with these changes, um, but they could be priced out or they could be um, but the, be when insurers offer stingier coverage or coverage with low annual limits, and individuals might conclude that coverage is just worth, that the coverage is worth taking because they're so sick, but they would be left without access to coverage that provides meaningful financial protection or access to care. Um, we have finished a little bit quickly, so I'll open up just for a few minutes to see if there are any questions, um, and if not, we'll wrap this one up a little bit early. 
So please uh, put a question in the chat box um, or the Q&A if you have anything for us. As we always say at the end of these webinars, um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask offline, you can feel free to email me or Barbara or, um, or Marcella who have provided their emails in the past. My email is nporter, P-O-R-T-E-R, at N-A-E-H dot org. And also I just saw a question that this was um, the fourth in a series and when we, where can we find the first two? I believe that all of our organizations have, pasted, have posted these um, recordings on our webinar, on our websites. So you can go to endhomelessness.org to find recordings of the first three uh, sessions. Again, we thank you all so much for your time and we hope that these are meaningful um, bites of information for you about the proposed changes so that you can be better advocates and better providers for your populations back home. Thank you so much.